Welcome to the third episode of Wood Academy TV. I'm Ralph Bagnall, but I'm not here to lecture you today. This is actually the subject of the next two episodes of our show. It's a library stand or book stand. We all know that woodworking is inherently dangerous. You can get injured doing it. And that's why you need to read, understand, and follow the rules that come with your tools. We also know that safety glasses and using hearing protection in the shop is a must. Now in this episode, we're going to reduce stock into 1 8 inch strips. I'm going to show you a couple of different ways to do that but ultimately, it's up to you to figure out the best way to do it in your shop with your tools, no matter what I tell you or what anybody else tells you. Your own safety is up to you. Your brain is your best safety device. The top is adjustable so that you can set the reading angle at whatever position you want. And it's just as useful for reading books, I use it in the library of my home, or you can use an iPad or even a small laptop on here and utilize it as a stand-up desk. Now each project here on Wood Academy is designed to teach you a few tricks and tips, and this one's no different. The subject here is the laminated bent wood pieces. All of these parts are made up of eighth inch thick strips of wood laminated together around a form. It's a highly useful technique to know even if you're not going to be building this particular book stand. In this episode we will prepare the bending stock, make the forms, laminate the bent wood parts, and size them for use. In the second part we will make and assemble the frame and top, fit all the parts, then assemble and finish the stand. Now the first step in all of this is to create the eighth inch thick strips that we'll need to bend up into our forms. In general, more thinner strips laminated together make a stronger piece than fewer thick strips. And you'll get less spring back the more strips you have layered together. But there's a lower limit to that. Creating eighth inch pieces is much easier than creating things that are thinner than that unless you have a drum sander. And Eighth inch strips are really easy to work with mathematically. Four eighth inch strips is going to be a half an inch thick. Five is five eighths, etc. So for this project, eighth inch strips was the right way to go. So here's the list of the strips I'm going to need to bend up all the parts for this project. I'm going to need 12 strips, an eighth of an inch thick, at 36 inches long by three quarters wide. Now, the 36 is longer than I need because I'm going to need to be able to trim the edges. You'll see that as we go. And the 3 quarter needs to be overly thick as well. I'll mill up a piece that's 7 eighths thick because when I lay those strips together, there's no way I'm going to be able to guarantee that they're all exactly aligned. There's going to be some misalignment and we need to be able to joint one face and then plane the thing to the final 3 quarter thickness. So I need 12 of those. I need 18 pieces at 18 inches by an inch and an eighth. So again, the blank will be a little longer, uh, wider than that. And then I need eight pieces that are 12 inches long by a half an inch for the small curves that adjust the top. As I've found in most woodworking tasks, there's more than one way to do what we need to do here, to reduce this board into eighth inch strips. Now, for many people, the easiest method, and certainly one of the safer ones, is going to be to simply rip this down on the bandsaw, cutting the pieces a little more than an eighth of an inch thick, and running them through a drum sander until they're all exactly the thickness you need. If you don't have a drum sander, and I don't, there are other ways to accomplish the task. Another method that I've used for many years is a thin rip jig. In this case, I've set the thin rip jig so the point 
is an eighth of an inch beyond the left side of my blade. The off fall will become the part I want to cut or I want to keep. So the rip fence is then adjusted until the part is touching the thin rip jig and this piece is ripped off. And the off fall will become the part we keep. Now with each pass across the blade, we need to bring the board and the rip fence over until we're touching the rip, the thin rip jig again, and then we make another cut. And we just keep doing this until we get the number of strips that we need. The drawback to this method is that although I can get pretty consistent cuts, every time I bring this fence and board over, that's a little too tight. I've got to micro adjust everything. See, that's a little loose. Depending on how hard I have this board and the rip fence pressing against the jig, that's going to slightly alter the difference in the thickness between my parts. Maybe not enough to make a difference but it could. Now my preferred method of doing this is to actually set the rip fence at an eighth of an inch away from the blade. I have a zero clearance insert here so there's full support for the part as it gets cut off and I'm going to use the grippers from Microjig to make these cuts. Now I've got two grippers so I'll be using the hand over hand method and they're both outfitted with an eighth inch leg which allows me to cut right up against the rip fence and I've got them outfitted with the uh, gravity heel which at the end of the board will actually drop down and pick up that eighth inch piece and push it through because these boards are a little bit long so these are sacrificial I'll make an eighth inch cut in each one of them but the advantage here is that I only have one setup and I can rip my boards continuously and each of the pieces is going to be exactly the same thickness because it's one setup, so there's no variation from part A to part B. Now there are a couple of different ways we can go about bending these strips into the wood pieces that we need. I prefer to make a two-part mold. I'm going to cut this piece of 2 by 8 material along the arc that I want the part to end up at and then be able to use both sides to clamp the parts together. I've got a trammel set up. I want a 21 and 1 8 inch radius on the inside of the curve and 21 and 7 eighths on the outside of the curve removing three quarters of an inch of material between the two pieces. You have to remove that. You can't just make one cut and try to squeeze it back together because we have to account for the change in the radius, the two different radii, so that our parts get clamped appropriately. Otherwise you'll have gaps. So I need to remove two pieces or that middle section but I'm also going to bend it a little bit tighter radius than what I want to end up with. It's going to spring back a little bit once I unclamp it. Hard to judge exactly how much that's going to be. In this case, I've reduced it by about a half an inch overall to bend it just a little bit too tight, let it open up when I unclamp it, and it should be very, very close to what I want. So with my compass, I'm going to go ahead and scribe an arc at the 21 and an eighth minus half an inch. And then I can extend my compass out to the other mark I made, three quarters of an inch further along. 
and mark that line as well. Now this whole section in the center, that's what's going to go away. I'm going to cut that away using the bandsaw, sand these two lines so that they're nice and smooth, and then we should be ready to start clamping. This is for the largest of the three arced parts. I've got to do the same basic thing for the other two shapes. So this is the form we laid out for making the legs or the feet of our book stand. It's an inch and an eighth wide curve or arc that I'll cut out of the center of the board. It has to be an inch and an eighth wide. Here are the strips, the eighth inch strips that we cut up for one of the legs. There's nine of them, which will give me an inch and an eighth. And they're going to bend into this slot so it's the same thickness and I've got this so that these pieces are exactly an inch and an eighth stacked together that's important as I said earlier once this is bent up it's not going to be easy to change the thickness along this curve I'll be able to change the width I'll joint them and then plane them to the proper width at the end but the thickness, once they're bent up, is very, very difficult to change. So that's what we've set up here. The thickness is determined by the pieces, and then the part I remove from the form is going to be that same thickness. So we're going to use the bandsaw, cut this out, and then sand it to the lines. You don't want to have glue applied to everything and then find out your forms aren't correct. So do a dry run. In this case, this is the main stretcher piece. I've got excellent um, closure of the gaps. There are no gaps between the pieces or between the pieces and the form. This will give me a really nice glue up. Same thing for the feet. Again, no gaps. Everything glues together. The pieces are longer than they need to be. Uh, they'll be trimmed back after the fact. But these will give me excellent glue ups. Now this process will work very well just gluing these pieces up while they're dry like they are now for these larger parts which are longer pieces and bent at a fairly gentle radius. But it's a much different story trying to bend some relatively short pieces into a form that's essentially a four inch radius bend. If I try to put these in dry, they're just going to break. So here's a pro tip for you. I'm going to soak these parts overnight. Just in regular room temperature water, I've got a piece of PVC pipe with a cap on one end, I fill it with water, I drop these inside, I let them soak overnight. So my parts here have been soaking overnight. They're nice and soft as a result, much more pliable than they would be otherwise. So I can now start assembling this together. Now you can see that there's a great deal of push here that is required. So I'm going to start with a squeeze clamp in the center, which will help me start gaining on that push that I need.
and you want to try and make sure everything's going together nice and evenly. And then when I get to the limits of the squeeze clamp, I can bring in some more powerful clamps and just kind of alternate between the two. So now I'll use these two clamps to bring this in as far as I can, being careful to make sure everything stays as aligned as possible. Let's just lay them out this way so I don't have to play with them. And now I'm going to bring this in as quickly and as evenly as I can just to kind of work everything together. I've had, there's been no splitting of these wood pieces, wood strips, which is good. And I'm just going to bring this thing in evenly. Notice that I've also got, I've scribed a line at the very beginning of all this. I scribed a line through the center of the form and that helps me keep the plug that I'm inserting now with the strips nice and evenly matched to the main part of the form. Now I've reached the limit of the clamps, the main clamps. So I'll tighten up the spring clamp, retract these as far as I can, and then we'll start the process over. Now we'll just set these in place, get them snug, and I'll just keep working the parts this way until I've got everything where I need it to be. Now what this is going to do, I'm going to let these parts dry inside this form. Boy, I've got a good fit here. You can hear the pieces squeezing as they get in there. I'm going to let these dry in this form. And then that way, when I let them out of the form, they'll be already partially bent into the shape I want. It'll be much easier to clamp them up once I've started applying glue and I've got a time limit. And then It'll just make everything a lot easier as we go forward and they'll be dry, but there'll be a lot less chance for them splitting because they're already preformed. Now these have had several hours to dry since I put them together wet. So now we'll pop the whole thing apart and see what we can get out. So obviously there's some spring back because there's no glue in here, but we've already got a good start for the next time we want to bend and the pieces are nice and soft. So these are going to be ready for glue. What I will do is basically tape them off at the same bend that they're at, let them finish drying and then we should be good. Being well prepared is going to help a lot in this next step where we're actually going to glue up our strips. So you want to make sure that you've got everything laid out. I've got my form here and I've applied a piece of packing tape across both surfaces to prevent the glue from getting between my parts that I want to keep and the form. The packing tape doesn't stick real well. It's not going to stay there for any length of time. It's just a barrier for glue. I've got my clamp set up. I've got some stretchy wrap that I'll wrap these pieces in once they're glued up to keep them from shifting side to side too much. And I've got my glue. I've got a little bit of blue ta painter's tape to put over the rails of my clamps just to keep them from getting too uh, messed up with glue. We're in pretty good shape. So now it's just a matter of applying glue to each of these strips until they're all covered and ready to lay up into the form.
A squeeze clamp positions the plug side of the form quickly and easily, and then just a couple of standard clamps are required to hold the two sides of the form tight together with the parts firmly clamped between. The two-part forms not only provide superior clamping by applying pressure along the entire bend, but require far fewer clamps than using a single-sided form. Now the pre-bent parts are just a little bit different. Even though they're not glued up yet, they're dry, but they're already largely formed into the shape we need. We just got to compress them once we put glue on. So they're a little bit different because you're going to be applying glue to the rounded outside parts, but you know, it just requires, the good news is it requires, the bad news is it's a little bit more time consuming. The good news is that you only have four pieces of each of these because it's only a half an inch thick, so we have four eighth inch pieces. So really, it's just a matter of, it's going to be messy, but we'll just get it all coated up. This is, in some ways, a little bit easier, in other ways, a little bit harder. I can lay my pieces right into the form and get everything kind of squeeze together and then we can start applying clamps. Earlier I mentioned that the forms are cut to a slightly tighter radius than I wanted my parts to end up at. And as the part is released from the form, you can clearly see the spring back. I decreased the radius by about a half inch, and as you can see, that turned out to be nearly perfect once the parts are unclamped. And so here we are. We've got some nicely bent parts, very stiff. But most importantly, they're very similar. I've got two parts here, and when you put them together, they're as close as I could possibly want them to be, which is important because they're going to be matched legs. These are going to be put together like so, but they also match nicely. And the little horseshoes are half rounds that are going to become the rotating part for the head, those also came out quite well. The next step is to clean the parts up. The faces that were against the mold should be clean and nice and just need a little sanding. But the edges, there's going to be a little variation between your layers. Those need to be not only flattened, but also squared up to the sides of the part. And the jointer is the right place to do this. I've set the jointer to a relatively shallow cut, and I'm just going to feed the piece across, kind of trying to keep the grain oriented perpendicular to the cutting head as I go through. It's important that this back face, which is smooth and a known commodity, is fairly tight up against the fence of your jointer, as close to the cutter head as you can keep it as you feed through, in order to ensure that the face we're about to clean up is square to the back of our part.
The 180 degree piece is going to be a little more difficult. We could trim these ends off, the straight ends, they're going to get lost anyways. But since I don't really care about them, I'll keep them in place. But it's going to require kind of starting back here and then bringing the contact point over and kind of working around the uh, blade guard. And again, we'll do this with some push pads. Now that we've got one of the faces parallel to the edge, we can run through the planer to get them to the proper thickness. There's three different thicknesses, so there's three different processes here. But two pieces will be set up the same. Again, I'm going to try and start the piece perpendicular to the cutting head and then turn it as it goes through to try and maintain as closely as possible that perpendicularity. But these are thin pieces, they're glued together, there's little enough risk of chip out, but I'm going to take nice light passes as I go. Of course, as with the jointer, this piece is going to be a little more difficult. I'm going to try to start it like this, because again, I don't really care if the cutter head tears out this section a little bit, but then I'm going to try and feed it through and rotate it to stay perpendicular with the cutter head as much as possible going in this way. If you're not comfortable running these tightly bent parts through your planer, you always have the option of hand planing them to the final width. Join us for part two of our library stand build, where we will make and assemble the frame and top, fit all the parts, then assemble and finish the stand. Now, if you'd like to build this project for yourself, a complete set of plans is available for free on our homepage. It includes measured drawings, photographs, material lists, everything you need to make your own version.